All right, let's switch to cricket, lovely cricket. Round four of the ongoing West Indies four-day championship concluded at various grounds across the Caribbean on Saturday, with the leaders taking a hit in their campaign for the title. Let's have a look at the first match, the win of the Islands Volcanoes taking on the Trinidad and Tobago Red Force. This was at Queen's Park Oval in Port of Spain. The win was Volcanoes, 191 in their first innings. Alec Athenes getting a half century there, 56 against Anderson Phillip, 5 for 37. Trinidad and Tobago in reply, 294. So they had a 103 run first innings advantage. Tian Webster with 107 not out. And Kenneth Dembo taking five wickets for the Volcanoes. Then the wind was in their second time at bat, doing much better than the first innings, getting to 288. Jeremy Solizano uh, getting 70 in the second innings for the Volcanoes. Jaden Seals, three for 45. And good to see him fit and bowling well. And then the Trinidad and Tobago Red Force and getting to victory at 186 for four. Jed Gouli retiring hurt on 90. Kavim Hodge taking one for 19, while well, the best bowler for the Volcanoes, Red Force, winning that one by six wickets. Let's get in Nikhil Uttamchandani on this discussion. Nikhil, great to have you. How are you doing, first of all? Yeah, I'm doing well, Ricardo. It was amazing to see you in the field yesterday at uh, that Jamaica game and doing some nice hard work, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, the only man who's watched more regional cricket in the last week than I have is uh, right here, Nikhil Um Talk to me about this win on Islands, Trinidad and Tobago um, Red Force game, because the win was when um, they played their first three rounds here in Jamaica looked rather imperious, and I wondered if they could go through the campaign unbeaten, Trinidad and Tobago trying to build some momentum. And this must have been a pretty good win for them. Yeah, massive win, Ricardo. I think I expected on paper, you look at the two teams, especially that the win was welcome someone like Ali Athenes back. Um, great to see him contributing, but I would have thought they would have started as favourites in a Trinidad batting lineup that I think uh, is still trying to find its way, trying to find that, uh, I think, right combination. And guys like Tion Webster, who came to the fore, is someone that I think really needs to gain that sort of consistency. And he's shown us the potential of what he can do at the regional level. This is his 25th first class game. And he's now notched his third hundred. But I think we've seen this a couple of times in terms of his talent. Think back a couple of years ago when he was in the Caribbean Premier League. We've seen what he's capable of. But I think he'll be really hoping now that someone like him can build on that hundred and maybe get one or two more to end the season and really sort of knock on the door. But what was the big standout for me was that the West Indian players or those that are sort of on the fringes. So you look at the Silva, Athenes both getting 50s, and then Seals and Anderson Phillip who played test cricket uh, at the end, well, in 2023. It's great to see those guys contributing, and I think that is what we need from our regional setup. Can we get our West Indian internationals and A-team players uh, being the ones that are standing out and being the ones that are dominating? Yeah, we've been singing that tune for the duration of the tournament so far. Let me quickly just run through the other results uh, from round four before we move on. And Nikhil, um, where do we start with the other matches? Let's go. Combined campuses and uh, colleges, yeah, taking on the Leeward Islands uh, Hurricanes. This was at the Sir Frank Warren Memorial Ground. The combined campuses and colleges, 273 in their first innings. Amari Goodrich, top scoring with 75. The Leeward Islands Hurricanes replying with 259. Karen Powell, 114. CCC, 361 in their second innings and the Leeward Islands Hurricanes getting to victory, losing seven wickets, so they win by three wickets. Moving along to the next encounter. Guyana Harpy Eagles taking on the Barbados Pride at the Coolidge Cricket Ground. The Harpy Eagles 436 batting 142.1 overs. Always good to see 
but it was Ver Samuel Pomon who top scored with an unbeaten 90 Kimar Roach, 2452. Then the Barbados Pride, 230. Jonathan Drakes getting 101. In their second innings, Guyana Harpy Eagles, 136 for 8 declared. Um, Kevlin Anderson, the top scorer with 33, 3 for 32 for Jamil Warwick and the left arm spinner and the Barbados Pride. 309 the Harpy Eagles winning by 33 runs that was quite an exciting contest there it was also exciting at Sabina Park in Kingston where the Jamaica Scorpions beat the West Indies Academy by two wickets West Indies Academy 324 Joshua Dorn top scoring with 83 OJ Shields 3 for 38 for the Scorpions Pete Salmon led with 81 for Scorpions as they replied with 372 the West Indies Academy then got to 281 after Joshua Bishop had taken 6 for 96 and then chasing 235 for victory. The Scorpions got to 236 for 8, led by the captain Brandon King with 65. So two half centuries in the match for Brandon King and Joshua Bishop ending with 10 wickets in the match. The left arm Barbadian spinner. Um, for the West Indies Academy. So that was pretty good to see. And just a quick word since we ended there on Brandon King, because I was quite impressed with his approach um, against the West Indies Academy. It's not the best team in the competition, um, but sometimes um, you look for more than just the runs on the board. And he got a couple of half centuries, and the approach for me was also important. How did you see it? Well, let me just say that if he's impressed Ricardo, then he's done something well, uh, right. But what I'll say in terms of Brandon King or Ricardo, it's just amazing to see him back playing red ball cricket. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around his technique, his game, and many believe that he can be a feature in that West Indies middle order. I, what I would say, I would even look past that. You hear some of the best T20 players in the world. Josh Butler mentioned it for an early part of his career. Virat Kohli always speaks about it. They always say how much the red ball game can just help you as a batter in the T20 format. We know how important Brandon King is to the West Indies T20 international side. I think just being able to spend time at the crease and bat in high-pressure situations like he did in that second innings where they were eight down, and he really guided them home, I think it was going to do his game, you know, a world of good going into a very important year in T20 and white ball cricket on a whole for the West Indies. But I think the second innings was a real standout to me because of the fact that they lost wickets at the other end. You're batting on day four. But also, it's a West Indies Academy bowling lineup that I'm very impressed with. Joshua Bishop, Ashby, Ned together have taken 45 wickets together. And I think uh, the fact that they're both in the top five wicket takers, it tells you how well they've bowled this year. You've got Naeem Young, uh, who's quite wily with his pace. You've got Johan Lane, who was menacing at times. So it wasn't an easy run chase. And I credit the West Indies Academy and CCC, who we saw earlier, for fighting and taking these teams deep into day four and making them really have to earn victories because everyone thought initially, especially for CCC, I know many people thought they would just be a rollover, but they've really put up a great fight. And it's good for our game that we've added these two teams and it's been more competitive. Yeah, I want to ask you, Nikhil, about the chances of the Windwards going all the way in this championship because the last time we had Windwards players winning a four-day championship in regional cricket, I think would have to go way back to 1981 when they played as the Combined Islands when that team included the likes of Andy Roberts and Vivian Richards and Windward's players like Irving Schillingford and um, uh, Winston Davis and so on. So I know they had won a Super 50 title back in 2018, but the Windward's cricket is improving. We can see that. Uh, they lost their three-match winning streak in this defeat this past weekend, but they look capable of rebounding. And I just want to get from you if you think they can go all the way and win the championship. Yeah, definitely, Lance. I think when I look at two things, one, their batting lineup is extremely strong. Um, I think even without Athenes and Hodge, who were their two West Indian guys, their batting lineup, and they've made some quite smart acquisitions as well. They've got Shamar Springer in, uh, retained him from last season, but they've also got Tevin Walcott, the keeper, who hasn't really come to the fore as yet with bat, but he sort of bolsters that batting lineup. But I think when I look at that top seven, it's one of the strongest in the competition. And then the way that their spinners have developed, they've got Daryl Cyrus, who's a leg spinner, and Kenneth Demba, who showed with his finger spin just how potent he can be. He picked up a five for in that game, which I thought was the turning point uh, and, and what allowed sort of them to wrestle some momentum back. So I think when I look at that team, they're definitely one of the strongest in the competition. What I would say is I think the Leeward Islands are a force to be reckoned with. They lost that first game against the West Indies Academy, but since then it has been carnage. And 
Justin Graves, they've just got him back from the Australia series. They, he's a newcomer who they've brought into this season. They've also got O'Shane Thomas, who we haven't seen as yet. But then you look at the spin that they have. Cornwall, nothing needs to be said about what he's achieved at the regional level. Daniel Durham, who with his height and extra bounce, is really causing some problems for batters. And then Hayden Walsh Jr., who hasn't even done too much with the ball as yet. And then Jeremiah Lewis pitching in with his team. So I think, I think the, the Leewards and Winwards play each other in the final series of the season. I think this could easily come down to it between the two of them. And it's great for our cricket that these two teams are at the top of the table right now. You yeah. can't rule out the defending champions, Guyana, but I definitely think those two are who I'm looking at. Yeah, you just mentioned Daryl Cyrus just now. I was having a look at him because as a leg spinner, leg spinner usually have some license to bowl some bad balls because there's much less control as a wrist spinner than there is with a, a finger spinner. But I find him very steady. He doesn't bowl that many bad balls. How good is he, Daryl Cyrus? Yeah, what impressed me was in the Super 50, which was white ball format. He played for Winwards. It was his first real opportunity in professional cricket. And as you mentioned, under pressure, he, he held his own and really held his nerve. So when guys were coming at him, I remember he played the Barbados Pride and seemed to hold his own well enough. And then now in the red ball format, uh, speaking to some of the guys in the Windward Islands Volcano setup, he's put in a lot of work in the offseason, specifically on his action, just bowling a lot more deliveries so that he establishes that rhythm coming into the season. And so far, it's paid off. He's been in the wickets. And as you mentioned, the control has been key. Another one I'm looking at, Zisha Motara. 17 years old, picked up seven wickets in the first series, sorry, second series, but 17-year-old leg spinner who, again, six foot three, and I think is a prospect we can look to for the future. Yeah, I notice we're speaking a lot about the spinners, um, Nikhil. <laughs> is there any fast bowler that you've seen in this tournament that we don't already know about that you will say, yeah, I've, I've been impressed with what I see from him? Well, to be honest, Ricardo, and I know many people have always complained that he doesn't have the pace. But what Jeremiah Louis is doing this season with 23 wickets, I think it can't go unnoticed. He's bowling in, a, in an attack that has guys like Cornwall, Durham, who will, one of them probably will get four or five every innings. But Louis has swung the new ball, and even the old ball, to be honest. I've even seen him get some reverse swing at times, which I've watched him over the years, and he hasn't really been able to find that much swing consistently throughout uh, maybe an 80 over span. So... It's been really impressive. I don't know what they've done with him in the offseason because he's always had a 10-wicket or 12-wicket season where he's been in and around contributing but not consistently. If he can go on to get 40 or 50 wickets this year, I just wonder if how close is he? He's been in and around the West Indies A setup. But if he finishes in the top three wicket takers, surely he must be knocking on the door, even if it's not in the international side, in a consistent A team setup um, to then try to make a way into the test team. Yeah, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want to get your thoughts on the surfaces because um, just looking at the entire tournament so far, there seems to be great contests between bat and ball, the spinners, the fast bowlers, the batsmen are all having a chance on the surfaces that I've seen to date. Yeah, I think the fact that we had four direct results in this series, um, it means well. I think we want entertainment in our cricket. Uh, batters will tell you they want flatter decks. The bowlers will say there needs to be more in it for them. But uh, watching some most of the games, I think the pitches have been relatively consistent. I want to give credit to Jamaica as well because they have dealt with the most cricket. And to me, the pitches seem to have held up pretty well. You're getting scores consistently over 300 and you're getting close run chases as well, which means batting on the fourth day is not as difficult as it has been in the past. I think there are some cases where there's been some variable bounce. I was happy to see at Coolidge that you had live green grass for the first two days of that Guyana Barbados game. And this is what, I mean, Kish, Dr. Kishore Shallows stressed on it a lot when he came into power. Pitches are the most imperative thing for our cricket to improve. And I think there has been an improvement when you look at how much cricket we've played with the addition of two new teams, meaning two extra games. Yeah, for sure. And I was certainly impressed with the wicket at Savannah Park for the last round against West Indies Academy because first two days I thought really good for batting by day number three. There was some assistance to the bowlers and day number four, more assistance for the bowlers. But the batsmen still had a chance if you have the technical ability to withstand what was being um, put to you. And, and we saw that it ended up being a great game, but it wasn't the only great game. There were quite a few and we had for outright results. Nikhil Chandani, as usual, it's a pleasure speaking with you, and I'm sure we'll chat again soon because there's a lot more cricket to talk about, including this week where we'll have more regional 
four day stop. Take care. Let's go to a break. We'll be back with more on the Sports Mag Zone. Mariah will have her favorite part of the show, Zone Update 2.